Well, first of all, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Patrick Watson. Uh, I'm the senior partner for IDEV International in Latin America. And I'm going to talk today about the proliferation of M-commerce in Latin America. What we as a firm um, have seen with regards to some of the key driving factors behind getting Latin America as a region ready for the continued proliferation of M-commerce. And what we think are the sector trends and opportunities that are going to be coming up during the next uh, three to five years. So, we're going to look at the driving forces of the digital economy from a point of view of technological, sociological, um, and some of the governmental changes that are happening as well. We're going to look at that trends and opportunities over the next three to five years, and some of the barriers that need to really be addressed to start accelerating that, that growth. Before we kick off, I'm going to just give a very, very quick uh, intro to IDEF uh, as a firm. So we are a um, management consulting and investment advisory firm that believes a strong private sector, a well-functioning private sector, not only benefits the wealthy, but the middle classes, the base of the pyramid. It is the best way of developing an economy and getting people out of poverty. So I'm not talking about purely socially impactful businesses. I'm talking about businesses that are well run, generating jobs in an economy and effectively supporting the growth of a country as a whole. How do we do that? That's our, that's our theory. How do we do that? Um, so we have two, two main sides of the business. One is the Insight and Strategy Group, which is focused on helping small, medium-sized businesses develop, refine, and implement um, in business strategies to, to continue growth in a country or region or a sector. And then we effectively add to that investment advisory, which helps improve liquidity in a market by providing one investment advisory support for funds to help them find opportunities and invest in those opportunities in specific markets. And then on the sell side, we work for businesses to help them raise funding to go and kind of reach that next level of scale. Geographically, we're focused on Latin America, East and West Africa. We have three offices, San Francisco, Lima, which is where I'm based, and in, uh, in East Africa, in Nairobi. Um, to date, we've been around since 2008. We've worked with about 250 SMEs. We've helped raise over $50 million in growth capital to get those SMEs growing, operated in 45 plus countries. Um, we built up a network of 150, 200 investors. I think it's, it's, it's nearing 200 now. And through the businesses that we've been working to build, we've impacted more than 2 million households. So moving into the driving forces of the digital economy. Um, one, of the things, one of the things that I, I had to send this presentation to Miriam on Monday, so it was a bit of a rush to get some of it finished. In doing so, I completely forgot to put in a definition of what the digital economy is. So if you look on Google, there's around about 50 million different, different uh, search results. There are millions of different uh, opinions of what it actually means. For the sake of the presentation today, what I'm talking about is just a digitally enabled economy of providing goods and services to a population, facilitating the move of goods and services in the economy through the use of digital technologies. Okay? So moving into the driving forces, we've got four that we've realistically identified as the key factors in Latin America. One, the growth in wealth and middle classes. Two, rapid urbanization. Three, cheaper technology, which everybody's witnessed, and high connectivity that's resulted from that. And then four, the large, prevalent, unbanked population and underbanked population. And I'm going to explain what that means in a little bit of time as well. <clears throat> so, going into the first one, growing wealth and middle class. So, as you can see from these three lines, um, there's been a consistent rise in incomes in Latin American countries over the last 10 years. If you look at, um, if you look at the uh, GNI growth from 2005 to 2014, it's between 11 and 12% per annum. That is approximately the same rate that Sub-Saharan Africa is growing. However, that's growing to a level which is an average wage of nine times what you'll find in Sub-Saharan Africa. What that has led to is 30% of the population is now considered the middle class. You have an average wage of $9,900, and that has led to a greater disposable income, and as such, an immense demand that is growing 
for goods and services. And from that demand, people are trying to innovate to go into that. There is supposed to be a... Uh, can you guys see uh, the continents? This is showing a different... Yeah, perfect. So, um, Latin America and the Caribbean are now have the largest urbanized population in the world, with 80% of the population living in cities. This compares, as you can see, with 38% in sub-Saharan Africa, 57% in Asia. You combine this with um, mobile user penetration, 67%, as you can see, in Latin America, versus 40% and 63% in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. What this effectively means, you have an ideal mix of technology. You have people that have moved to urban centers and are using mobile technology. Another kind of byproduct of this is that they've moved from provincia. So what that effectively means is a lot of social bonds and ties have been broken, and people are looking for other ways to maintain those, those connections. So what are they doing? They're moving to mobile uh, digital technology. Latin American internet users, on average, use 10 hours of social media a year. Sorry, 10 hours of social media a month. That is twice the global average. It is a continent that is ripe for taking that kind of digital literacy and starting moving it over to the purchase of goods, services, directing of those goods and services as well in the economy. Add to this cheap technology and you'll see what's happening, explosion in technology. You can go to any phone shop in Mexico and find a digitally enabled phone for $50. You have 68% of Latin Americans have mobile phone subscriptions. Now that is the third highest percentage after North America and, and Europe, which are already fairly digitally enabled economies. So it's a country that is just on the brink of getting there. Currently, only one out of three of those mobile phones uh, are smartphones. However, if you look as that goes towards 2020, this percentage is looking to go up to approximately 70%. That is an additional 300 million people that are going to be coming onto the digital economy in the next three years. That is a massive market. It's effectively finding another Brazil in Latin America in the next three years that these digital economy countries, uh, companies that are developing technologies can start to try and access. You mix that in with the reality of today. So you have a region which is poised to start using digital technologies for, for, for consumption of goods and services. However, you have a large percentage of people that are unbanked. And it's not just a large percentage, it's the majority. Uh, well, it's actually 49%. So it's nearly the majority. It's just under half of the population in Latin America do not have access to a bank account. Or 70% um, are considered underbanked. And by say, when I say underbanked, I mean do not have access to loan products, credit cards. They're effectively not being used as effectively as they could be by the financial sector. Okay? So what does that mean? That's impeding the current E and M commerce build out because there's no way of getting to a bank, an unbanked person if they don't have a bank account or it's very difficult and different solutions need to be, need to be looked for. But it also presents a massive opportunity. You bring those bank populations on and you've got access to a much bigger market than you already have access to now. So it means growth in this market is going to be phenomenal because you're almost creating new customers that didn't exist yesterday. Uh, looking at the chart, you can see uh, the, the leading countries in, uh, in banking are Chile and Brazil. So Chile and Brazil have 63% banked and 68% uh, banked respectively. And then you come down to Mexico and Colombia. Mexico and Colombia have 39% of the population that's banked. That means 61% don't have bank accounts. You then go to Peru and the situation gets even worse. 29% have a bank account, 71% don't have a bank account. That is, there's a bigger market for people that don't have bank accounts than for do have bank accounts. So it's people of companies have spotted this opportunity in the market and uh, are starting to take advantage of that. And you're seeing a lot of that will start coming up in the next few years. So before we move to the kind of key trends and uh, the key trends and opportunities in the market, it's, it's critical to understand that um, for the adoption and enabling environment of digital technologies or e-commerce and m-commerce in a specific economy, you need three types of organizations to work together. 
you need first the technology innovators. You need those companies like Mercado Libro, Libre, Kingo, Kulki, that are developing the solutions specifically for the region. Not necessarily American companies coming down and starting to develop technological solutions for the Latin American market, but Latin American companies that understand the user base and are developing solutions for that user base. You need early adopters. So when I talk about early adopters, they're the larger businesses that understand the importance to adapt to the market, embrace technology, and incorporate it into their operations. The businesses that are willing to take risk and spend money to see if they can get that edge over the competition. There's companies like OXO here in Mexico, which is incorporating digital payments into their, uh, into their, 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 their chain of um, shops. There's Telefonica, which has obviously got the Wire Accelerator, um, which has been doing great uh, developing a lot of great businesses over the last uh, five, ten years to slot into the Telefonica larger conglomerate. And then you've obviously got some of the other ones, Banco de Chile and Claro. The third one are the ecosystem enablers. Now the ecosystem enablers are effectively, they're the accelerators and incubators, but it's effectively government funded organizations or what the government is doing to create this enabling environment. It is trying to break down barriers so organizations can scale. So you'll see that with, for example, um, uh, you'll see down there in uh, ecosystem enablers, you'll see BIM, which is a Peruvian mobile phone platform that is effectively, uh, it's a big consortium of all of the big, big uh, telcos and banks in, in Peru to help get uh, momentum in the market. And you'll also see uh, things like Startup Chile, Government Initiative, a lot of other government initiatives in the, in the region which really need to start propelling these technologies. The Pacific Alliance is going to help that as well, um, allowing organizations to prove their market in one country and then scale to other countries. And that's, that's really key. So moving to trends and opportunities. The first one. So the first one, I'm um, talking about the uh, the talking about BIM a, a couple of minutes ago. One of the the really exciting things that's happened in Peru recently is um, this launch that happened in Q1 2016 of this BIM platform. Basically, what happened is all of the largest banks and telcos came together and created a company called Pagos Digitales, and Pagos Digitales is managing the rollout of a nationwide mobile, mobile payment platform. The idea is that organizations can, um, well, it's basically going to be operable across all of the different networks. And then from being operable across all the different networks, you can get smaller companies um, trying to work with the big incumbents to differentiate products and allow them to compete on a, uh, on a differentiation basis. You have um, specifically in the region, um, one of the, the, the key issues that really needs to be tackled is in Latin America, there's invariably a l lack of trust in these mobile payment platforms. So whilst BIM is trying to get rolled out, there needs to be a number of other ways of pulling people across onto this mobile platform. So you need to look at what are the hybrid models that you can use to pull people across. So as I mentioned, OXO earlier on as a, as a, as a, a chain of shops, you have technologies that are linking in to physical shops where you can make online pay, you can make online purchases and you can pay for it in cash. You've got organizations like PayU and Punto Red are starting to develop these partnerships so that you can actually start to sell online but pay actually physically in a specific location. Um, one of the other things that's going to be exciting over the next few years is Whilst we have got this launch of a mobile payment platform, there are other technologies that could work as well. Mobile payments, for those of you who know, have only really worked in Kenya with M-Pesa. And that was due to a number of specific factors to the region at a specific time, due to economic crises, um, monopolistic power, and, and certain other factors about a Kenyan's ability to take up this technology. There are other ways in which it can be broken as well. So you have Bitcoin. Bitcoin, that technology, is allowing people to make transfers at a much reduced rate than what they typically could do. You've got an organization called um, Abra, based in the Philippines, looking at Latin American expansion over the next couple of years. They, I heard they've been here recently over the last month to look at Mexico as the markets start entering. They do P2P transfers, which effectively brings down the cost of you transferring money from A to B to 0.1%, which is significantly cheaper than what you can find in the market. 
And that is only going to get other technologies that can really start linking into that Bitcoin technology um, is, is going to take off over the next three to five years, specifically in Latin America. Number two, alternative banking and loan services. So you've got a massively informal market in a lot of countries in Latin America. 49% don't have bank, bank accounts. That's people, that's also companies. How do you start to get access to those people if they don't have formal banking history? You have to look at inform, well, alternative methods of analyzing your potential client base. How's that? Credit scoring. So there have been a number of companies that have come up recently with different credit scoring techniques that look at your Facebook profile, that look at your typing speed, that look at different psychological details, that look at your utility bills. A whole range of things. You can have these things without having bank accounts. And so by being able to do credit scoring through these alternative methods, you're allowed to provide services or develop a, a credit history for somebody without using the traditional methods. Organizations that are already doing that, for businesses you have Tienda Pago and Innova Funding, which are providing factoring services, working capital funding for businesses. For individuals, there's Cuesqui, which is the success case here in Mexico, and Destacame in Chile. And then um, another movement that we're seeing is the opening of online banks. So there are a number of banks that are taking advantage of people's need not to have, or people's, well, need not to have physical structure for a local bank. If an organization can get around that and actually be able to provide the same banking services without having the big infrastructure that a lot of these banks require, they're betting on being able to bring down transaction costs and be more competitive in the market. You've got here in Mexico, Banco Ul, and New Bank in Brazil that are, that are trying to kind of break into that market. We see over the next few years a number of other competitors coming into that online-only banking services as well. Number three is effectively... Um, so with over 45% of the population with internet access, consumers are ready for a better consumer experience. It offers better purchasing options or greater purchasing options, diverse payment methods, expanded logistics, and speedier delivery. Global online purchasing models have been around for a while, but Latin American solutions have been a little bit late to the game to start offering these, offering these types of services. Everybody's seen the success of Mercado Libre, which is now in 15 plus countries in Latin America, or 15 plus countries generally, which is paired up with Mercado Pago to facilitate payments online. Um, and some have gone even further. Impresi in Chile has basically taken a similar model, but it's got um, image recognition in its app such that you can sketch what you want, and then it'll search for that in its catalog of goods and bring up all of the similar products it has chairs, carpets, whatever, so that you can basically say, I don't know the mark of this, but I saw it and I liked it. I'm going to draw it, the pattern, and it'll go search for it for you. So it facilitates that. It, it just facilitates the entire purchasing process, whereby you don't even need to remember the brand of something to go and search for it on the internet. Getting that brand presence right and providing a Latin American targeted experience, which is pay on delivery and in cash, will increasingly start drawing consumers away from bricks and mortar and towards E and M commerce. With only 5% of businesses having mobile enabled platforms, it's a huge market here in Latin America. And that we expect to continue growing and growing and growing over the next three to five years. The last thing, which is, which is, which is one of the things that we're working on uh, a lot at the moment is allowing people to start in remote communities or end users to start paying for the goods and services according to how they consume it. So we can talk about utilities. Getting renewable energy or getting different types of utility services like heated water out to rural com consumer bases so you can start paying as you go. So pay as you go. There have been organizations, Kingo in Guatemala, Paramundo in Peru, which are selling renewable energy products, and you basically pay for it as you're consuming the electricity or as you're consuming hot water, however which way you want to do it. But having that kind of mobile, digitally enabled payments platform is a way that these organizations, they don't have to have a physical infrastructure to go and payment, collect payments. They can do it through having these automated transfer payments. It's something that's worked in East Africa. East Africa is a very different region, but it's a proven model that can really start bringing down costs. And we're seeing more businesses starting to come up and start breaking those, those, those markets that are outside the capital cities. So mobile solutions. Mobile solutions is, um, it is something that uh, Latin America kind of lacks 
uh, with lagging behind a number of other regions in the world, primarily due to very difficult topography. Um, it's very costly to send things out to a lot of distant towns and cities where you do not have the critical mass of populations out there to make it worthwhile having a, a, a fixed distribution line. So a lot of tech can enable transport sharing, for example. So you have ways of reducing intermediaries in the supply chain, you have better ways of connecting supply and demand, and you have supply chain financing, all of which can be solved during, during, uh, using digital economy solutions. Examples of this are a grouper in Colombia. A grouper in Colombia are taking, uh, they're, they're grouping together bodegas in, let's say, Bogota, and they're linking them to the market. So instead of 30 bodegas having to go to the market and buy their products individually, incurring transport costs, not buying the bulk that they need to get product discounts, you're able to group them together in an app and then basically make centralized purchases and then have it distributed out using, again, a distribution, you know, using distribution methodology of GPS which brings down the cost of running a bodega, allows them to start offering different products and services, and starts facilitating the, the, the generation of more revenues, uh, and, and also improving the way in which bodegas are functioning generally. With companies, you've got Rutear in, Ar in Argentina, which is taking existing haulage company transport lines and then selling existing space in it. So if you're 80% capacity and you're going out to a distant city, somebody can rent that 20% capacity and send their products out there as well. That means they don't need to buy um, haulage for the full distance. They're, they're sharing your cost, which is significant saving in sending things out. So it really does bring down the cost of sending things like logistics and transportation in countries. In Peru, it's a big issue. In Argentina, Bolivia, all of the Andean countries. In Mexico, it's a massive issue. Um, and we do think that this is going to be something that's going to start really improving the productivity of logistics companies in, uh, in the region. One unex unexploited, currently unexploited uh, extension of this would be, one, being able to pay on delivery. So basically not having that physical collection, uh, not having to do physical collection payments, but actually using mobile money to do, um, to do payments for specific long distance haulage. And secondly, doing wages on during mobile payments as well, which is going to, again, mean you do not have to have that physical infrastructure in place to be able to start paying your employees. So um, I've touched on this already, so I'm going to go through this one relatively quickly. Incumbents and startups collaborating for scale. So I mentioned the BIM platform. That's a big collaboration with all of the, all of the large players in Peru. You have a lot of small companies coming into this to enable the banks start differentiating their products. There's a whole load of collaboration going on there. You've got a number of other businesses that are doing collaboration between large incumbents and small tech providers, such as the credit scoring. You've got organizations like EFL, Lendo, Tiaxi, which are providing alternative credit scoring for the large incumbent banks, meaning that banks can start accessing new people using their, their balance sheet. And these organizations can use effectively just a very um, turnkey solution and go and do credit scoring using their technology. Very little investment required to do that, but it allows you to start accessing a much larger, cl larger client base. And true scale will only come from moving into new regions. And that is going to require a bit of collaboration. You've seen the Pacific Alliance coming up. As we start to open up these new markets, Mexican companies are going to start seeing Colombian companies that they can collaborate with as the regulatory boundaries start coming down and it makes more sense to move into Colombia with existing proven models in Mexico or Colombian models that can go into Mexico. Really breaking down that barrier is, is, going, to be, is going to be key. So the rise of Latin American innovation hubs. I mentioned back in um, a few slides back the different ecosystem players and how you need to have certain organizations doing certain things to allow an enabling environment for these businesses. It's good, good to say that um, a lot of Latin American governments are really starting to turn their attention on Latin American startups and starting to really start to strengthen the ecosystem for Latin American startups. Startup Chile has been around for a long time. Um, it's really starting to move some money. $7 million was invested in uh, 2015 just in its portfolio companies. There's been a lot more money that's been leveraged from the companies that it's built up and it's attracted from abroad. On top of that, a much bigger amount, $400 million was invested in Ruta, uh, in Ruta N, which is a, a, an accelerator, Medellin, um, and that's basically been funded with $400 million since it, since it was incorporated. Of all of the accelerators, um, 
in Latin America, 19% are purely funded through government initiatives. So the government is really starting to step up and start funding this ecosystem. That is compared to less than 10% in, in uh, the US and 14% in Europe. So it's a much bigger focus. It, 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 it's a much bigger focus because there is more of an ecosystem to build up, but it's good to see that the money is starting to get directed towards that space. One of the things that we, we, I do want to caution is that we've been, uh, I've been in Mexico City since the weekend, and uh, since last weekend, and um, there's a lot of talk of, yep, there's a lot of excitement, a lot of people investing in the market, it's great, there's no exits. And, you know, there are a few exits that have happened over the last 12 to 24 months. Um, it is something that we've seen in all of the Latin American countries that we work in through, throughout the whole region. People are waiting for exits from these accelerator incubators. People are really waiting for the Series B rounds to come in. Now, that is happening, and even the Series A's for a lot of these accelerators. That is happening. You've got angel networks that are starting to be developed throughout the region. You have some very established angel networks here, like Angel Ventures Mexico. Um, they are starting to be developed throughout the region as well, which is the Series A or the seed stage round. And then in the Series B, over the next year to, 12, uh, to 24 months, we're going to start seeing a lot more of these uh, larger funds coming in and, uh, and investing in these businesses. One thing that the accelerators do need to do, which has been uh, a, a very slow work in progress, is strengthen the link with these angel networks and with these early stage investors. A business, when it goes into an accelerator, is effectively looking for capital at the other end. And that's a fundamental thing that all of these accelerators need to really focus on as, a, 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 as something to um, kind of be one of their cre cr critical success factors in trying to sell their services to uh, businesses that want to come on. So um, number seven, this is the last one, uh, investors chasing the Eldorados of e-commerce and fintech. So the investment space in Latin America has blown up in the last five years. In 2015, $594 million of VC funding was deployed, which is almost 10 times what was deployed in 2010. So in five years, it's increased by $550 million, which is, which is enormous. Brazil is clearly leading. You can see from the, the, the bubbles here. Brazil, that's, that's all relative to VC investor size. Um, Brazil's enormous compared to every other country. However, you do have Mexico is starting to grow as, a, as the VC space starts to mature. Argentina's opening the borders. So Argentina, the VC space is really starting to develop as well as a lot more f foreign funding comes in. Colombia and Chile are starting to grow as well and develop, uh, develop, their, own, uh, develop their own hubs. You have had some impressive uh, investments over the last over the last, uh, what are we in October? Ten months here in um, here in Mexico with with Kresge, thirty-five million dollars there. So there is there's, flu there's 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 liquidity in the market, and people are seeing that there's a lot of excitement and opportunities here. So we see one the VC space growing, the opportunities rising up as well, and a lot more foreign investors coming down to start invest in uh, Latin American countries. And Mexico is very well positioned to take hold of that because you have the largest market here, you can prove a model and then scale it as the Pacific Alliance starts to develop. So, um, so that's all, all really positive. It's all looking good. However, there are still some fairly fundamental issues that need to be addressed before, um, before the digital economy can really be um, kind of get up to speed with what's happening in North America and Europe and, and let's say Asia. Some key barriers to, to address are a culture of cash. People are wary of di digital currencies. Approximately 50% of payments in Mexico are made in cash, which, is, which goes up to 75%, over 75% in Colombia and Peru. So people are very used to cash, and they don't get rid of it very easily. Governments are trying to get people moving over to, the, to, to mobile payments um, or financial inclusion. So you've got the Mexico's recent national finance inclusion strategy, which is going to do government transfers um, through mobile payments. However, there needs to be more of a demand. There needs to be more of a pull to get people over to getting used to doing it. So utility bills, having um, a whole range of different things like taxi payments. You've already got Uber, but, but, but taxi networks that aren't just in Mexico City but are also being, um, uh, uh, being rolled out in the regions as well. Access to credit, as soon as you get people more used to actually not using cash for their everyday, then you're going to get starting to pe pe people to get come across and start using more and more things 
um, on the digital in the digital economy. Getting to scale, few payment systems have succeeded in reaching national or regional scale in Latin America. The region will benefit from a scalable solution, having a regional platform, and then you can have small companies tap into that regional platform to provide local country uh, solutions to the specific needs of the populations there. That's, that's something that is, um, will be improved over the next couple of years, but at the moment, it's just, it's just not there. Where's the talent? Um, by that, it's not that where's the talent, it's Look north to San Francisco, look north to Silicon Valley, and you've got a ton of feeder companies. You've got Apple, you've got Google, which are effectively incubating talent to then go up and set their own businesses up to then tack into the solutions that Google and Apple, for example, are, uh, uh, are producing. In Mexico City, you're starting to get organizations that are, could be um, thought of as more feeder companies, but in the rest of the region, it's still lacking. You need to get companies that are developing the talent for them to then leave, develop the technologies, and really start getting digital, innovative digital solutions uh, up and running. The third one, uh, the fourth one, is business and infrastructure as usual. Now, due to um, quite heavy regulatory burdens in a lot of Latin American countries, there are a lot of monopolies that are effectively dominated the market with high margins and are not really willing to innovate. There are a number of banks in the region that are very averse to innovation and are, are actively trying to block it. What needs to happen is there needs to be, the barriers need to be brought down, there needs to be innovation that's really incentivized to a lot of these organizations, uh, a lot of these large companies, and that could be through government initiatives to start embracing it and start using innovative solutions within their supply chain. So I mentioned Telefonica, for example, uh, using the wireless solutions. We need more organizations that are willing to embrace risky technologies to extend their network or extend their reach in a specific market. Additional point, one last point with the business and infrastructure as usual, is that there have been a lot of improvements made, but you still have 10% of Latin Americans still do not have internet coverage, 5% do not have electricity. That is something that, one, it is an opportunity for organizations that want to tackle that, but it is also uh, something that really needs to be improved. So um, it's always bad to finish on a bleak note. Those are barriers to address, but they are all addressable. The opportunities in the region are massive. Over the last week, I arrived on Saturday, and over the last week, we've seen so many shared workspaces, so many VC funds that are doing interesting, interesting deals. There are the exits are going to start coming. Liquidity is improving every day. Everything's pointing in the right direction. It's just a case of, you know, the government needs to get more involved, and there needs to be the momentum needs to be kept up for this to really start getting to some interesting levels. Thank you very much.